Our next speaker this morning is Sonia Hall. She's speaking um, with Kurti um, with from the WSU Biological Systems Engineering, and they're going to talk a little bit about the effects of changes in climate on coddling moth and other insects, and I really appreciate her um, coming to speak with us today. A reminder that you can text in questions to the number on the sign, or if you're on the Zoom, you can turn that into, or put those in the Q&A, and please make sure to silence your phones. Thank you so much, Sonia. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Um, let's see. I want to start off by acknowledging that um, I wasn't the original speaker who was going to present today. Kirti uh, Rajagopalan, uh, who's the, the lead for this work, was unable to, to travel, unfortunately, and so she asked me to step in. Um, and I want to acknowledge the team that carried out the majority of this work. Um, so Kirti herself, uh, Vince Jones, who retired a couple of years ago, uh, who was the, the lead for the decision aid system that um, Chris mentioned earlier, and Hussein Nurazar, who actually did the majority of the analysis that I'm going to talk about today. So we were looking to ask two questions. The first is, as the climate changes, as temperatures warm, what can we expect in terms of coddling moth pest pressures in our region. And tied to that, what does this mean for management? And I I'm, I'm, was really glad that Chris had that presentation right before, because um, it helps provide a lot of the context potentially. Um, short answers are that we do expect to see an increase in pest pressures um, and that, that isn't necessarily the story uh, or the answer to what Chris presented, um, but there may be some interesting connections. And in terms of management, um, the, it will become even more important in the future to capture those uh, pesticide application windows as part of an integrated pest management approach. Uh, but if you are able to do that, there are opportunities for, for reducing pesticide use in the future. So that's the short answer. Now I'll give the, the long answer. So this study is based on modeling. We use the, um, the coddling moth population model that's used in DAS. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with that and use those, those models, um, this is based on the same, the same model, uh, which uses the fact that insect populations respond to temperature as temperatures increase, the growth and development of the population increases in a predictable way. And that's what the model captures such that you can take the weather data, you can translate that into accumulation of degree days or of heat units and use that to drive the phenological model that that shows how the population grows and develops. Um, and in DAS, that's used to identify uh, the moments for, uh, for spray timing. And so what we did is we took historical weather data and ran the, um, the coddling moth population, uh, population model multiple times. And then we took climate change projections of what's expected of future temperatures and ran the model with those. And then we compared the results under, under both scenarios. Um, so briefly to give you a little bit of background on that, those future projections, um, as the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere increases, there are changes in time in climate. The ones we're focused on here are increases in temperature. Uh, we don't know exactly what the, the future holds and what those increases will look like. And so the way that climate um, change scientists address this is they look at a variety of scenarios. They think, well, if emissions go up this, keep going up this way, or if they change in this way because of policies, 
can we can we develop scenarios for what that might look like and then see what the climate would do um and so it is common to use these representative greenhouse gas concentration pathways as some of those scenarios. And you'll see in the slides that I show um, that we use two different ones where RCP 4.5 represents a moderate increase in temperature through to mid-century and then tapering off, while um, RCP 8.5 represents uh, a greater increase in temperature that continues through till the end of the, the century. And the other aspects that the climate modelers do is they use a variety of models that capture different nuances of how the climate works. And then they package it all together to give a range of conditions that we might expect. And so this is what those range of conditions that we might expect look like for the Pacific Northwest um, related to temperatures. So these are annual mean temperatures, relative to the historical mean. So the zero means um, we're staying the same average as we were historically. Anything above the zero means that temperatures are increasing. Anything below is that the temperatures would be decreasing. And as you see, for both of these scenarios, you have that those ranges, but everything is increasing with fairly little difference between the two scenarios um, to the middle of the century, but then spreading out um, further on. So these are the two scenarios we used, but let's get to um, the coddling moth results. So as I said, we ran the coddling moth uh, population model with historical uh, conditions or historical temperatures. We ran the coddling moth with future uh, temperatures at different time frames. So we ran it with the conditions that are expected by the 2040s, by the 2060s, and by the 2080s. And you can pull a number of parameters to try and quantify what's happening with the population. This is the timing of the first adult flight of coddling moths. So those um, individuals that overwintered, when do they uh, emerge as adults? Um, these are maps of our region. This area is down in the Columbia River Gorge and all the way up into the Okanagan Valley up here. And what you can see from, from these results is that historically, these, uh, these areas further north have late emergence of that first flight as late as May 10th, while down in the warmer areas around the Tri-Cities, they are somewhere in early April, which would be about halfway here. But as we look into the future and those temperatures warm, that first adult flight is happening earlier and earlier and earlier to the point that by the 2080s, they could be as early as early March in these warmer areas uh, in the basin and in, in early April uh, to the north. Another consequence of these expected increases in temperature is that the season in which the coddling moth can grow and develop essentially gets longer and there's more opportunity for accumulation of heat um, of those heat units that drive their population. So even though historically and, and now, uh, on average, you expect to have two generations of coddling moth with, in some areas, in some years, you could have a third one. Um, that risk of having a third generation of coddling moth um, is increases significantly as those temperatures increase. By the 2040s, we actually expect that the majority of uh, the region will have a third generation as sort of business as usual uh, situation. Um, and because of that accelerated accumulation of, of heat units, that uh, there's also the potential for a fourth generation. And again, that's something that's fairly uncommon. You can see that um, you're in the blues over here. Almost never do you get that fourth generation uh, of eggs hatching into larvae, which of course are the ones that cause the damage. Um, 
as you go further into the future, when it's warmer, you start seeing much higher risk of that um, fourth generation to the point that by the 2080s, we expect that to be uh, business as usual for the majority of the region. So um, all of this is pointing to, yes, as the climate changes, as temperatures increase, the pest, pest, pest pressure from coddling moth will increase as well. Um, but as you probably know, um, nothing is a straightforward answer. So one of the factors that could moderate that increased pest pressure is the response that coddling moth has to photo period. So when days get shorter in the fall, uh, that's the signal for the moth uh, to go into diapause or into the dormancy that allows it to overwinter. Well, because now we have an earlier first adult flight that's laying eggs, and then that first generation is developing more quickly because, because it's warmer, and so it develops more quickly, it means it reaches that stage where it's, it's um, the, the moth itself could go into the, the pupae and could overwinter when it's still early enough in the spring that the days are still short. And so that photo period response means that we actually expect an important part of that first generation of coddling moth will go into diapause. And so they will not only overwinter, they'll sort of over summer and then overwinter and come out the next year. If they, if they are able to survive through all of that. Um, so these are, are complicated figures, but essentially it shows in blue um, what you expect of the total population of coddling moth. And you can see those, uh, those peaks for each generation. And then in yellow are the moths that escape that diapause early on and continue to um, complete their cycle and lay eggs in the current um, in the current season. And so what you can see as you compare, as you go from historical down to the 2080s, you can see that the difference between these two, which are those moths that will go into diapause early, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so, uh, and that's even more so in the warmer areas um, uh, in, the, in the basin. So all of these moths here, will be going into diapause. This of course has two immediate consequences. One is that that photo period response will moderate and, and um, have a, a negative effect on, or from our perspective, a positive effect, reducing that pest pressure in the current season. But those moths are overwintering and, and contributing to the next year's season. And so all of this points to how important it is to control coddling moth in that first generation, both for what happens for the rest of the season and your ability to, to, to minimize the damage from, from the remaining generations, but also what happens next year. So what about uh, our ability to control it? Um, Chris was describing a lot of the nuances around mating disruption. This takes a, a sort of more generic view of, of it, but essentially what we did was build into the model the effect of mating disruption, uh, which is the first set of bars, the effect of sprays on the first generation, so both ovicides and lar larvicides sprayed um, in that first generation, and then combining both. Uh, both treatments. And again, these are, these are complicated figures, but they all essentially have the same structure. So for five places throughout the region, we looked at what happens as the temperature increases in terms of the effectiveness of these um, treatments that are currently in your toolbox. And what we saw was that mating disruption actually has the potential to become more effective. So this, these, these figures show the, the, the moths that, or the proportion of the population that escapes the treatment, what you have left after the treatment. 
So the lower it is, the better. Um, so you can see that historically, uh, the, the effect of mating disruption leaves a fair amount of that population uh, still in place in these models. But as you move um, to the 2040s, the 2060s, the 2080s, as those temperatures increase, um, th this the mating disruption becomes more effective. And what we think is happening here is the mating disruption basically delays the, the mating of the moths. And so if it delays it two days, but in those two days, because it's warmer, um, the, the population and the, the, um, the moths themselves are developing quicker, a delay of two days now is a smaller effect than a delay when the temperatures are higher. And so that's what we think is driving this, this effect. So they're still delayed two days, but they become much older in those two days, essentially. Um, you don't see the same effect with pesticides. And this may be an artifact of how those treatments were implemented in the model, because this is a modeling study. Um, and so the treatments were, were designed and put in to be optimal for capturing those moths. And we know that in real life, it may not always be possible to really hit the right window, make sure you hit um, the right window at the right time um, in the right way. Uh, but it is clear that it's the combination of both the mating disruption and the pesticides, uh, the pesticide applications that has the potential for, for bringing down those, that first generation um, of, of coddling moth. Um, and so because of the improvement in the effectiveness of the mating disruptions, there may be opportunities to reduce pesticide use, um, but it will be really important to apply those pesticides in the, that optimal way and, um, and hit that spray window and that timing really well, which is going to be more challenging because for, for a similar reason, as the temperatures increase, the, um, the coddling moth develop quicker. And so um, the oviside, for example, will have a narrower window in which those eggs are vulnerable uh, because they're developing so quickly, a narrower window in which they're, they're vulnerable to the pesticide. Same with the larvicide. So to, to summarize, um, yes, we expect to see an increase in pest, pe pest pressure uh, of coddling moth, uh, particularly um, with uh, a greater number of uh, generations. And that's consistent with studies that have looked at other insects as well. But there are opportunities uh, because of that improved efficacy that we expect from mating disruption in the future. Um, so there are opportunities to lower pesticide use. The importance is to keep in mind that those spray windows are gonna be narrower. And so it is all the more important to have tools such as the decision aid system that help narrow in on what the right timing is and to be able to organize so that you are able to apply those, um, spe those pesticides in the optimal way. And with that, I will, if there is time, open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Sonia. That's super interesting. Let's give Sonia a big round of applause. Thank you.